Over the past 36 years, Final Fantasy has featured reams upon reams of incredible characters. Protagonists such as Cloud Strife and Squallion Heart received the top billing in their respective games, and due to the nature of their stories and the popularity of the games that featured them, they would go on to become some of the most popular and iconic video game characters of all time. There have also been plenty of supporting characters that have managed to make a name for themselves, such as Tifa Lockhart, Oren, and Ignis Scientia. And lest we forget some of the incredible main antagonists who have graced the franchise over the years, such as the maniacal Kefka Palazzo, Arden Izunia, and of course, Sephiroth. Many of these, thanks to how well they embody their respective roles, have been so well received that they too have broken free, being recognisable as video game characters as opposed to just being Final Fantasy characters. Now, given the importance of these characters and their respective narratives, this, of course, makes perfect sense. Large portions of these narratives are focused on the actions they take, good or bad, and it means there are plenty of opportunities for them to make meaningful and impactful contributions that resonate with players long after the controller has been put down. But what about characters who fall outside of those defined groups? How many of them have managed to break free from their shackles and make a contribution so significant to the wider narrative that it elevates their status? Due to the very nature of their existence, NPCs are seldom afforded much screen time. Their primary purpose is to help with the world building and serve as a facilitator for the narrative at that specific moment in time. These types of characters have been there since the very beginning of the franchise, with Matoya being one of the earliest examples. But as each game has grown in scale, so too has the volume of NPCs, and this means their individual impact can actually become diluted. On the odd occasion though, we've seen NPCs that manage to be so impactful that even though their screen time was limited by comparison to the game's main protagonists and antagonists, their status was elevated to be on par with some of the stars of their respective games. Aranea Highwind serves as a fantastic example of this. Introduced as a minor antagonist partway through Final Fantasy XV, Aranea then became a temporary ally thanks to the gratitude of Arden Izunia. But we later learned that Aranea was simply a muscle for hire, and after learning the truth about what was happening within the Niflheim Empire, she refused to fight under their banner any longer. What's impressive is that the story of Aranea was delivered in approximately just 74 lines of dialogue, of which only 59 was mandatory. To put this into perspective, compared to Aranea, Noctis had more than double the spoken lines of dialogue in Chapter 1 alone, and Prompto, Gladiolus and Ignis also all had more lines of dialogue in Chapter 1 than Aranea had in the entire game. After the release of Final Fantasy XV, Aranea would appear within Episode Prompto, this time as a guest character, and this only served to further develop the significant fan following that had started to develop. 18 months after the game launched, an opportunity was then provided for those fans to voice just how popular Aranea had become. As part of Patch 1.10, the development team asked fans to vote on future updates they would want to see. One of the options related to Aranea being made into a playable character. Based on how consumers voted, it was later announced that Aranea would be getting her own DLC episode. This would launch as part of the second Final Fantasy XV season pass alongside episodes dedicated to Arden, Ludafreya and Noctis. Unfortunately, that DLC was subsequently cancelled. But the sentiment was there, and as a result, Aranea has featured in prominent fashion whenever Final Fantasy XV collaboration events have taken place. For example, she appeared alongside Noctis and Prompto in the War of the Visions collaboration event that took place in 2021. Judge Gabranth has been treated in a similar manner, being immortalised as the Final Fantasy XII representative in every single entry into the Dissidia franchise. And then there's the Turks, who have become fan favourites due to how they have been portrayed throughout the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. To stress though, these characters are exceptions as opposed to being the rule. And that's why we wanted to focus on making this video, as we need to talk about another exception, Dion Lesage. In the build up to Final Fantasy XVI, Dion was revealed as the dominant of Bahamut, 
the Crown Prince of the Holy Empire of Sanbrek and the leader of Sanbrek's Dragoon Corps. As such, there was much speculation as to what role Dion might play within the story, not least because, based on his roles, there were numerous points of reference back to the wider franchise. The speculation was then fueled by Dion appearing troubled during some of the trailers, and having now played the game, it's safe to say that some aspects were right on the mark. But what nobody could have predicted was quite how much of an impact Dion would have on the wider narrative and the game's lasting legacy. Now, before we undergo this extensive character study, please use this intermission as your spoiler warning. From this point on, we will be discussing intricate details relating to the narrative of Final Fantasy XVI and revealing the fate of specific characters. So if you have yet to finish the game, we'd recommend adding this video to your watch list and returning at a future time. Dion was introduced to the player after the defeat of Garuda. But instead of this introduction coming via a scene involving or relating to Clive, the player was instead allowed to view events that were taking place much further afield. Two powerhouses of Valisthea, the Holy Empire of Sambrek and the Kingdom of Walud had decided to lock horns. During the initial posturing, it was important for each respective power to try and assert themselves, if only to gain a significant psychological advantage. As such, they each brought their trump card. For Sambrek, that trump card was Dion Lesage. Having awakened as the dominant of Bahamut, Dion had become a figurehead for the Empire, known for his strength, dedication and incredible resolve. This reputation had been earned on the battlefield. Should conflicts arise, Dion would often be required to swoop in as the saviour of Sambrek, ensuring those conflicts would end with a swift and decisive victory. Dion had accepted this role, as even though using the dominant powers took a toll on his body, he believed it was necessary to ensure the lives of Sambrekois citizens were spared. But as the actions of the Emperor had become more and more tyrannical, Sambrek had begun to rely on their crown prince more and more, to either turn the tide of battle or hammer home an already inevitable victory. It also became apparent that many of these skirmishes had been created by the whim of a self-indulgent Emperor. Sylvester cared naught for the men and women who would die on the battlefield. What made this worse for Dion was that those men and women still fought with every fibre of their being for the glory of San Breck, and just knowing that their crown prince was fighting alongside them would often be enough to lift their spirits. That then brings us to the Battle of Belenus Tor. San Breck and Walud had been engaging in hostilities for some time, with King Barnabas having grand designs on the continent of Storm. This new offensive would see the Waluda forces attempting to regain the foothold they had lost some eight years prior, and to ensure they did not fail, Barnabas himself took to the field. To try and safeguard the lives of his fellow soldiers, Dion would be forced to respond. This sequence had featured within many of the promotional trailers for the game, but each time there was no context, and as a result, no agency. What we saw were mere snippets that were designed to place emphasis on the icons as opposed to the dominance who manifested the power. In game, the emphasis was shifted, and it was shifted in an intriguing manner. Instead of joining partway through the epic tussle between Bahamut and Odin, as had been hinted at via the trailers, we saw how the skirmish began and how it concluded. But the most interesting element from a narrative perspective was the active decision to place the spotlight firmly on Dion. By taking this approach, we got to witness some masterful visual storytelling. To give the audience a sense of scale and to introduce the stakes, we saw both sets of infantry duking it out. Odin then took the stage, much to the delight of the Waluda forces. And as the camera close-up settled in, Odin seemed to stare straight at the player. This in itself was rather smart, as it introduced Odin to the player as a powerful, imposing and intimidating figure. But in the next sequence, we saw something else. On the other side of the ravine stood Dion, staring down the colossal icon. His posture was assured, as opposed to defeated. And when asked the question, do you intend to engage him personally? Dion's response came with no sense of hesitation. 
Instead of succumbing to intimidation, Dion had been emboldened. Without a moment's pause, he grabbed his lance from Terence and ran forward, jumping from the mountain and transforming into Bahamut to take the fight to Odin. Although the following encounter would be brief, it lived up to the billing. Neither Dion nor Barnabas would be able to gain the upper hand on their adversary, and perhaps realising that a prolonged skirmish would result in considerable and unnecessary losses, Dion withdrew on his own terms. After retiring to a nearby encampment, Dion had learned that the Emperor had chosen to offer no reinforcements due to issues within the capital. This decision saw the Battle of Belenus Tor end in defeat for Sambrek, but it was only a fleeting victory for Walud. Upon hearing the news, it would have been easy for Dion to become demoralised. After all, the task he had been given had been made that much more difficult through his father's choice to retract the previous support that had been offered. But such was the strength of Dion's character and will that this news was galvanising. Instead of becoming disgruntled and petulant, Dion chose to return to the fray. He wanted to stay loyal to his troops and fight to ensure as many of them as possible would live to see another day. Using this fervour, Dion then helped to eradicate the Wuluda invaders, driving them once more from Sambaqua lands. The sequence was only 3 minutes and 22 seconds in length, but it contained so much depth and purpose. Even though we saw Dion fight to a stalemate and then retreat, the impression instilled was not one of weakness. Instead, this scene served to highlight the strengths of Dion, establishing a strong sense of loyalty towards his father, his empire, and the men and women under his command, which by extension also included the wider citizens of Sanbrek. This sense of loyalty would define Dion, but not in the most obvious of ways, for Dion was a man whose loyalty was split. When his objectives aligned and allowed him to serve his father, the empire, his troops and his citizens as one, then he would be a man at peace. But if Dion was forced to prioritise one aspect of loyalty over another, his moral compass would become misaligned. And as his father had become more and more wayward with his decision making, Dion found himself forced to make compromises and sacrifices, often at the cost of his own physical and mental well-being. It's what makes this sequence so powerful. Within such a short space of time, we learnt so much about Dion. Defining character traits were displayed within just a few lines of dialogue and purposeful physical posturing. And such was the strength of these traits that they will be used as a firm barometer through which Dion's future actions would be judged. Those future actions would take some time to manifest as Dion would be removed from the player consciousness for some time. It was only when the conflict between Sambrek and Dalmachia reached its conclusion that Dion would resurface. But even though so much time had passed, his actions would not come as too much of a surprise to the player. We would learn that Dalmachia was attempting to sue for peace. Amongst the Sambaqua councillors, this was greeted as positive news, but the Emperor had other ideas. Instead of honouring the agreement, he planned to accept the Dalmachian reparations and slaughter them as they retreated, wielding Dion as the blade that would slay their former adversaries. This decree presented quite the quandary for Dion, and it would provide another opportunity for those defining character traits to be cemented in the mind of the player. If Dion were to prioritise his loyalty, his father would sit at the top, with the Empire as a close second. Its citizens and its military would then jostle for third and fourth place depending on the scenario that presented itself. If possible, however, Dion would prefer not to have to choose to prioritise one over the other. In this instance, there was a feeling that, even though the Emperor's plan was barbaric and lacked honour, it could be tolerated. What couldn't be tolerated was that due to the close proximity of the attack, unnecessary Sambraqua lives would be lost. The council members all felt the same, showing their unease, but none of them had the authority to speak against the Emperor with any kind of conviction. And so, the mantle fell to Dion, and it was the Crown Prince who spoke up for the interests of the common folk. The response shocked and dismayed. Everyone listened as the Emperor extolled the virtues of the Empire, all while declaring that its citizens, the very lifeblood of the Empire, were worthless peons who would not be missed should they fall as collateral damage. 
After hearing this callous response, Dion was left with a choice. Defy his father and the Empire, or stay loyal and betray his troops and the citizens of Sambrek. This placed Dion in a perilous and unenviable position, and this was only compounded as even though he begrudgingly chose to prioritise his father's wishes, the contempt he felt was hard to hide. This subtext was perfect for moulding the wider perception of Dion as a character. We had already seen firsthand he was a confident, strong and loyal individual who had not backed down from a fight even if the odds were stacked against him. Here though, we got to see a semblance of weakness. Dion was forced to take a step back, to continue being the dutiful minion who would be required to follow his master's bidding without question, irrespective of how heinous the order. This could have been seen as a character flaw, as it showed that Dion wasn't quite the paragon of strength he'd been made out to be. After all, he would still choose to perform unethical and despicable acts if that was deemed to be what was required. However, as the players thought that these acts were committed under duress, this allowed them to sympathise with Dion's plight. This in itself would be a defining moment for the character and his relationship with the player. But as if to overemphasise the point, we also learned two additional pieces of information after Dion had left the throne room. One, that Annabella, a character who the player had been trained to despise, was actively plotting against Dion, and that too, she had manipulated the Emperor, leading him to begin questioning his son's loyalty. This had no doubt been why the Emperor had chosen to test Dion's resolve and commitment to the Empire, and having seen his response, it only supported Annabella's claims. The sequence, coupled with what was shown at the Battle of Belenna's Tor, would then provide a solid frame of reference for everything that would follow. And after the dust had settled, Dion would become cemented as one of the greatest NPCs of all time. Having joined up with the Dragoons just north of the Isles of Ark, Dion prepared to do his duty, in spite of pleas from Terence. Irrespective of the sacrifices that he would be required to make on a personal level, he would do what was necessary to try and save Sambraqua lives. That was, until Dion received unexpected news. Seduced by Annabella's wiles, the Emperor had abdicated and placed his son, Dion's younger half-brother, on the throne. This was the ultimate betrayal. For years, Dion had served the Empire and its Emperor, putting his own body on the line to see its glory continue. Even as the orders became more and more questionable, Dion had been steadfast in his conviction and his loyalty had stayed true. But this, this was a step too far. The promotion of Olivier was nonsensical. It served no logical benefit to the Empire. But as a narrative device, it was very logical. We had just seen Dion with his guard down, showing his benevolence and compassion. Sambrek and its people meant everything to him, and he was willing to throw away his close relationships and his health in order to see them saved. Olivier being named as the new emperor, despite still being a child, spat in the face of that sacrifice, and Dion deserved justice. To seek this justice, a drastic and uncharacteristic course of action would be undertaken. Dion would disobey a direct order from his father to return to the palace, and after an unexpected visit from Joshua Rossfield, he would go armed with powerful knowledge relating to the true nature of the threat that served to undermine Sambrek. But once there, everything that Dion held dear would start to unravel before his very eyes. In the initial sense, Dion had hoped to expose Annabella. This would open the door for his father to revert his previous decisions and Sambrek could return to a degree of normalcy. It was unfortunate therefore that Dion found Annabella far too slippery and cunning. For too long had Dion been away from the center of power, fighting wars at his father's behest. He had known of Annabella and the cutthroat nature of how she betrayed her husband Elwyn Rossfield but it was rare that the pair had ever locked horns and attempted to parlay. When the opportunity now presented itself, Dion found himself woefully unprepared. After suffering a humiliating verbal beating at the hands of Annabella, Dion therefore opted for another, more direct approach. 
Instead of succumbing to her manipulations and becoming Annabella's pawn, like so many others had in the past, Dion would instead become the very monster that Annabella had made him out to be. He would rebel. Supported by Terence and his ever-loyal Dragoon Corps, Dion seized the capital and demanded that Annabella and Olivier be executed for their crimes against the Empire. The initial stage of this plan worked. The capital was taken without too much difficulty and Dion gave an impassioned speech which argued that Annabella was the root cause of the demise of Sambrek's values, not his father. However, the threat that Joshua had warned about had been watching and waiting. That as emotions became ever heightened, Ultima awoke to take advantage of the situation. Provoking Dion at just the right moment, Ultima manipulated him into killing his own father. And as if it were not enough, he then gloated, shattering Dion's mind and unleashing the full force of Bahamut. It was only after being subdued by the combined might of Joshua and Clive that Dion was able to get his revenge, striking Ultima down. This whole sequence was full of emotion, and what made it so impactful was the nature of its execution. The recap just given is based on the chronological order of events, but in game it was shown out of sequence. As far as the player was concerned, Dion's rebellion had turned sour, and without context it was easy to draw an incorrect conclusion as to why. It was only once Clive had extracted the powers of Bahamut that we, as the player, understood the pain and suffering Dion had been subjective to, and upon the conclusion of the sequence, we were left reeling, not least due to the truly unforgettable boss encounter that was sandwiched in between. What pulled at the heartstrings was that Dion only ever had the best of intentions. We could glean from his interactions with Joshua and the way he spoke to his father that Sambrek was once a nation built on peace. They had taken part in forays against Walud, but never as the aggressor, and they saw Rosarians as their close allies. As the Emperor became more and more corrupted, Dion had been forced to spill blood in the name of the Empire, and often without just cause. By taking the actions he did, the hope was that Sambrek would return to its former glory, but instead, owing to the manipulations of Annabella and Ultima, who had both used Olivier, Dion suffered being the unwitting tool that would bring about Sambrek's downfall. From this point forward, from a narrative perspective, there was no doubt that Dion was considered friend rather than foe, and with his next few appearances, great effort was placed by the narrative team on showing the emotional strain Dion was under. He had always vowed to stand up for the interests of the common people, showing defiance against his father for the contempt he had voiced for the Sambraquois people. But, in a cruel twist of fate, it had been Dion who would be the one to inflict terrible pain and suffering on the people. This placed a huge burden on the Crown Prince, and upon returning to Sambrek to see the devastation firsthand, he broke down. This would open the door for one of Dion's more prominent traits to resurface. During that initial cutscene at the Battle of Belena's Tor, Dion was shown to stand tall in the face of adversity. And when he returned to Sambrek, we saw that same trait appear, albeit in a different manner. After being healed up by Kihel, Dion chose to not shirk away from his actions. And with subsequent appearances, the prominence of Dion only increased, as did the emotional weight of his actions. We first saw him come to the aid of Byron Rossfield and the former Dalmachian Field Marshal. He then reconnected with Jill and Gav so as to come to the aid of Joshua and Clive, and as the game reached its conclusion, we saw him reconnect with Harpocrates and choose to fight alongside the Rossfield brothers as they sought to go back to Origin and defeat Ultima. Having known where Dion had come from and what he had gone through, each of these appearances brought forth numerous emotions. After all, he didn't need to be there. He could have chosen to stay with Sambrek and try to help rebuild, but he had made a promise to Joshua that they would rid Valisthea of the threat that sought to ruin their very way of life. And even though he was emotionally beaten down, Dion was adamant that this promise would not be broken. All of this culminated with perhaps one of the most emotionally charged sequences in not just Final Fantasy XVI, but the franchise as a whole. Having used Tri Disaster against Ultima, Joshua, Clive, and Dion must have hoped they would be able to defeat the god that stood before them. 
But after it became apparent that this had done nothing more than antagonize Ultima further, something that saw him attempt to end the life of Clive, Joshua stood in to protect his brother. Dion though realized that the lives of Joshua and Clive were more important to the survival of Valisthea than his own, and he chose to make the ultimate sacrifice. Ordering Joshua to go to his brother, Dion stood face to face with the one who had caused nothing but pain and destruction. Almost everything good in Dion's life had been ruined by this god, and he held nothing back. This sequence just felt raw, and the sentiment was only amplified by an absolutely masterful piece of musical work. It's apt that the piece is called Only Forgiveness, as when the adjusted Ultima motif kicks in, you could feel the weight being lifted from Dion as he unloaded all of his pain. And Tomolo deserves a huge amount of credit for being able to manifest that emotion through the music, enriching the entire scene. Now, Dion must have known he would be no match for Ultima. His only solace was that he would give Joshua and Clive the chance to do what they needed to end its rule. There are numerous schools of thought as to whether Dion would have lived after what happened on Origin, but irrespective, the impact of this character cannot be understated. And that such an impact was felt despite the barriers is pretty astounding. After studying over 20 hours of footage that make up Gamers Little Playground's video that contains all Final Fantasy 16 cutscenes, only 6.55% of the footage pertains to scenes that contain Dion at some point. In reality, Dion only appears in 17 different cutscenes. And when cutting this metric down to actual screen time, not necessarily speaking time, it reduces Dion's footprint in the game down to around 5%. The point is that even though Dion doesn't have a huge amount of focus within the story, what's there had incredible meaning. It's the literal manifestation of impact over numbers. Expert story crafting and narrative delivery, of course, do help. But the impact of Dion is very much an ensemble piece. Stuart Clark deserves huge credit for his work as Dion's voice actor. Underneath the courageous and bold exterior, there's a sincerity, and this shines through thanks to stellar voice work. Then there's the various composers and arrangers who worked to build out Dion's musical themes. Toma Lo was mentioned earlier, but Ascension, which plays during the conclusion of the epic showdown against Bahamut, is one of the standout pieces of the entire game. And for this, Ryo Furukawa needs to be mentioned. He used a framework provided by Masayoshi Soken to produce what can only be described as a masterpiece. That this track serves as the backdrop for the fight against Bahamut is also fitting as that fight has become legendary. Needless to say, all of this has contributed to Dion gaining quite the fan following. And while we don't know whether he survived the encounter with Ultima or not, it's safe to say that should Dion have the opportunity to return, it would be well received. For now though, all we can do is look back on what was a fantastic character. Not just in Final Fantasy 16, but amongst the pantheon of NPCs who have graced the franchise over the years. Hopefully, this video has helped to further your enjoyment of Dion as a character, but irrespective, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please do hit the like button and subscribe to Final Fantasy Union for more content like this. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Arguan, Benjamin Snow, the Livestream, Gaussian Di Kajata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun DDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.